So about a week ago on the VetroCore channel we took a look at the RS97, a new emulation device from China, but the machine had a problem. The hardware itself was fine, but the software that was installed on it was complete and utter crap, for the most part at least. So today I'm going to show you how you can upgrade the software on this machine. Ok so the first thing you have to do is open up your device. So take out the SD cartridge adapter, get yourself a screwdriver and start taking out those screws. Now be aware that there is one more screw hiding underneath the battery. So once you've got all the screws out you can just pull the machine case apart like this. And here we can see the micro SD card hidden underneath this little bit of plastic sticky goo stuff. So first thing to do is lift up the little plastic spongy thing. Keep all of it though because you may want to use that later. And take out the micro SD card. Now this micro SD card is only 4GB in size and it's non-branded so you may as well just throw it away because you will need a much larger card for this mod. So I've got an 8GB card here and what you want to do is you want to connect that to your PC. Now we need some software so first go to this site here and click on the RS97 downloads option. That will take you to a mega download page. Here you can find various emulators, ports of different games, other software such as overclocking the device, the actual firmware which you will need, and various other things such as skins, wallpapers and boot images, as well as icons. Now the icons are kind of important because you'll need them for your emulators. So download everything you want from there. You'll also need some other software. This one is Win32 Disk Imager, so download that. I'm not going to download it though because I've already got it, so bye bye link. You'll also need this software called Minitool. Just go for the free download version at the top, that's good enough. All the links to this software will be in the video description by the way. You'll also need the Retro Game CFW patch. You may get this oops it's a network error warning on your screen, don't worry about that just click the link and download it anyway. As you can see it's quite a big file at 1.5 gigs. So first thing we've got to do is install Win32 Disk Manager, so install that onto your PC. So we're going to use this software to install the retro game CFW image onto our micro SD card. But first you've got to unwrap the retro game CFW firmware. Ok opening up Win32 Disk Manager find your firmware and then write it to the SD card. Make sure on the device you're picking the right uh, device which is your SD card. Now this will take quite a while so don't worry just let it go through its uh, routine and come back and check it in about a minute or two. Now once that is done you get all these uh, windows popping up. Uh, basically these are all the partitions on the uh, SD card which windows cannot read. Don't worry about it, don't format them, just cancel everything. Ok now you want to get back some more space which um, the partitions have taken away. So you need to install the mini tool partition wizard. Just click on the partition wizard free icon, find out which drive is your SD card, you'll know which one it is because it'll look exactly like this. And what you want to do is you want to go to the ROM section and click extend. Don't forget to put the slider bar all the way to maximum. This will give you back a lot of space which was taken away when you flash the image to the SD card. 
and most importantly don't forget to press apply otherwise the changes will not apply. As you can see it does it pretty quickly. Again Windows might tell you to check the SD card for errors but don't. And that's everything, your SD card is now ready. You've got your software on there, the new firmware is on there. So put it back into the machine. Don't forget to put that little pad back on to keep the SD card nice and secure. And put the case back together. Now you may want to put all the ROMs and uh, make a couple of files on the uh, actual hardware itself. So to make sure this is recognized by a PC, you hold down the B button and press the power button. As you see on this video, I'm holding down the A button. That's not right. You gotta hold down the B button. You'll know it's done correctly because Windows will make that typical USB sound. It tells you a USB device has been found. You'll also get a couple of menus popping up. So transfer all your data onto the machine. So here you can see I have the machine all set up with loads of data on the SD card. But none of the emulators can be found on the main uh, browsing screen. So what you have to do is actually put them there. So first thing you do is you have to link to an actual uh, bit of software or an emulator that you want to appear on the screen. So I'm going to put oh boy here. That's a Game Boy emulator. Now I like to just run the program first to make sure it's working before I go through all the routines of adding, uh, of customizing the link. Okay, and yes, that emulator seems to work fine. I'll fix the screen size and stuff later on. So as you can see, we've got a typical generic icon there. That's no good. So you press the start button and you get some edit options. You can change the title of the emulator, but I'll just leave it as it is. But I will add a description. The description will appear at the bottom of the screen when I highlight the emulator. I think we'll just put a um, Game Boy emulation. Now we also want an icon so it's easier to uh, identify the emulator. So go to the place on the SD card where you've stored or the internal memory where you've stored um, all your icons and select an icon that suits you. Some emulators may require you to link to a ROMs directory from uh, the setup menu, some don't. So now we have a lot of emulators stored on this machine, how do they run? Well let's check out Final Burn Alpha first, this runs arcade games, most noticeably Neo Geo and Capcom CPS1 and CPS2 games, as well as many other games from Konami and even some Sega Super Scaling games. Now since the original machine had Neo Geo and Capcom CPS1 support, let's check out those. As you can see we've got the Neo Geo running here and it runs really really nicely. Now any weird effects you may be seeing on the screen are not there in real life, they're probably just picked up by the camera. This is being filmed in 4K so it does pick up every minute detail. Okay, so let's take a look at some Capcom CPS1 emulation. On the original firmware that came with this machine, this was the only emulator that seemed to work perfectly well. And as you can see, it works really well here too. Yep, UN Squadron or Area 88 really had awful sound in the arcade.
But you know what, CPS1 emulation isn't really a challenge, so let's try some CPS2 emulation. Now this didn't work on the stock firmware. This is Vampire Savior 2. And as you can see, it's running really well. I will still say that the D-pad on this machine is absolutely useless for fighting games. It's bloody awful. So that would be the next mod to do. And how about a bit of X-Men vs Street Fighter? So as you can see, the arcade emulation is running really nicely. But what about home consoles? Well, here's PC Engine. One thing I must say is, while the screen is not the highest in resolution, it is pretty clear when it comes to uh, blurring. It doesn't seem to be a lot of blurring on screen. And here's some PlayStation emulation. Now at the moment, the emulators for this machine are a little bit hit and miss. Um, as you can see, here's Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and it runs a little bit slow. Uh, it is playable, but yeah, it is a bit slow. And here we are with Jumping Flash 2, and this runs perfectly fine. Unfortunately, when the game starts, it crashes, so you can't actually get into the game, which is a bit of a shame. But the video cutscenes work perfectly okay. But the beauty with a device like this is emulators are always being improved. So who knows, a bit further down the road we could see something that works PlayStation very well. Something that does work very well is Mega Drive. Just check this out. Full speed, 60 frames per second and it sounds fairly good as well. Now one emulator that did work really poorly on the original firmware was the Super Nintendo. Now I've got two Super Nintendo emulators installed on this machine at the moment. Uh, one is Pocket SNES and the other one is a port of SNES 9X. Uh, Pocket SNES uh, does have better sound emulation but it seems to run slow. Um, yeah, the frame rate's nice but it's just slow. And um, This is a SNES 9X you're seeing here. Runs at a good speed, but uh, the sound emulation could be a little bit better. There we go with the Vampire's uh, Kiss. And yes, as you can see, it's running fairly nicely and sounds really good too.
but there is somebody working on a Super Nintendo emulator that will run 60 frames per second and hopefully it will be released soon. And that's only a good thing because here we have Axley, which um, ran like a dog on the uh, stock emulator, but is running a lot better with these uh, newly installed emulators. Still not perfect mind you. And here we go with Game Boy Advance, and yes, it's looking fairly good, despite my crappy game playing skills. Is it perfect? Well, that's not for me to say because I haven't really played a real Game Boy Advance that much in recent years. Well, actually probably about 10 years. So there are loads of different emulators for this for pretty much every uh, system you can think of. Obviously I'm not going to show you them all. But apart from emulators there's even ports of PC games. Now you can run DOSBox on this, but besides DOSBox you can also get some individual games running. Here's a port of Doom 2 and as you can see it runs really really well. Funny thing is first time I ran this it did have music but uh, when running it, running it again for the video, um, yeah, the music wasn't playing. Kind of odd. So, as you can see, the new firmware really does improve this machine. Um, unfortunately, the Mega Drive uh, emulator does run virtual racing, but very poorly, and the Super Nintendo emulator will run Super FX games 1 and 2, but again, very poorly. But overall, this is a vast improvement upon the original software. It's definitely worth modding your device.